Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, hello everyone here in the room. Hello everyone in TV land. I would like to welcome Adam Boulanger today, recently upgraded to Adam Boulanger, PhD. Uh, I met Adam what, about a year or two ago in Boston, got some demos and videos, was really impressed. Uh, he's working really at the intersection of music, health, and computer science. So I'm very, for those of you who know me, I'm very excited about this talk since that's, that's me times three also. Um, and I was really impressed by uh, Adam not being one of those folks who works at the intersection of those things in a lab because it sounds good, but really spending time uh, in the health domain, really working with patients and uh, really working one-on-one -on -one with patients to produce some pretty impressive and exciting, uh, and I would say inspiring results. So I'm sure we're gonna see some of those throughout the talk today, and I will turn things over to Adam. Great. Thanks, Dan. So this talk is entitled Music, Mind, and Health, and in particular, I'm going to be focusing on how community change, diagnosis, and neurorehabilitation can be achieved um, not just because of technology or new applications, but in applications that target uh, creative tasks and uh, namely in our creative lives. Um, but first I want to start out with kind of a, a, a personal motivation for this area um, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Uh, you know, I grew up in a house where my dad was a computer musician up there in the top right. Some of the earliest memories I have are being, uh, you know, a kid in his studio or at avant-garde music performances where technology was always being used to, to challenge the way we think of sound, the way we think of music, and the way we think of music and structure and these kinds of things. And, you know, the kinds of role models or even the discussions that we were having really at the dinner table around luminaries like like John Cage and the ideas that you know, music is actually everywhere around us. It's in all the things we, we touch. It's in all the things that, that we experience. That's not just sound in the environment, that the organization of that sound is the wellspring of music and that we can access that as, as creators or maybe even as technologists. But then really in a sort of an opposite side of the spectrum, guys like in the bottom right, Stockhausen, also an influence of, of, of my father's and, and now mine, thinking of really the technicality of music, the science of it, how the detail of sound is something that's in the purview of a, of a laboratory kinds of science, that you know, as you experiment and dissect it, that there are worlds to discover even in the simplest kinds of sounds and sound relationships. So that kind of detailed way of looking at and dissecting sound as a science you know, can, can actually create beautiful, beautiful experiences, musical experiences. So um, you know, I think of these kinds of values really at the crux of, of, of some of the kinds of interface and technologies that I design. Um, and then just in music overall, uh, you know, I think of it as this kind of ultimate interface because of the dimensions in which it provides value. You know, we can think of music in terms of its cultural significance as part of every kind of culture, as part of our definition of culture, you know, music and maybe something like religion. I mean, I don't know, but there, there are a few things that are really part of our definition of culture and how it evolves. Music's almost always there. It has this kind of uh, uh, evolutionary and, and societal significance. But then despite that kind of global impact, there's also the personal commitment to music. So you know, the way that I have an individual relationship to something like music and can explore that you know, unending. Uh, uh, and no one can perhaps understand that relationship, but in the moment of performance, you're doing something to communicate and convey that to a group. So I mean, what other kinds of applications, and thinking of music as an application, have really that kind of uh, uh, dimensionality? And then really what's sort of interesting in, in, in accessing different aspects of, of, of music in, in technology and interfaces is over the past really two decades, our, our the way our scientific understanding of music has evolved. So whether it's music and perception or music and form or music and structure, there are different ways of mathematically representing it or, or, or you know, getting handles on uh, the different kinds of objects in music that, that are useful for perception. And as a result of this scientific understanding, we're now starting to see proactive uses of music in situations where there are I I incredible and, and diverse needs. So you know, this is a kind of clinical uh, uh, vector of music, which, which is new. Some of it's more scientific than, than, than in other areas. 
but we basically look at the way that music is distributed across many different aspects of human thinking and experience. As we understand that scientifically, we can structure new music experiences in, in, in the healthcare space. Um, so, you know, with a lot of these different dimensions in mind, I'm really looking towards music as a kind of flagship application area in the area of embedded healthcare. So, whereas you see often sort of two different strategies in the, in the embedded healthcare space, thinking of different ways that sensor networks and these kinds of things can create and capture the information of you know, a person as they're interacting in their environment around health, health behaviors, health types of sensing, and then maybe deliver prompts or deliver different kinds of, of applications in the environment. Or the way that medical information can, can be compiled and centralized kinds of records. I take a more application-oriented approach. I'm wondering how can um, healthcare experience and medical devices uh, how can we structure significant healthcare experience as part of our creative lives, as part of applications that have significant secondary value? You know, if we're behaving in a space and, and doing something in our life that has value, creative value, uh, uh, um, can we actually, can that be inseparable from, from our lives in health? And uh, we're going to further specify this throughout, throughout, the course of the, throughout the course of the talk. So there are three issues with, with directly partnering something like creativity in, uh, to healthcare. And uh, the first is, what does it even mean to access creativity? How do you provide creative experiences at scale in the general population? You know, do we really have, uh, 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 do we lead creative lives as a population? I think that's a big, that's a big open question. And, and technology, can it help actually make, make inroads into that area? The second is assessment. So this is actually a real problem. There is music in hospitals, and there is music in clinical work. But often the issue is, how do you describe causality in that kind of space? So if I have complex music interactions going on that are partly about relationships and you know, that have just so much really information embedded in that experience, the question is, how do I really assess what's directly responsible for any type of clinical, either physical or cognitive change, that I may see as part of that, that, that interaction? And then finally is, how do I personalize this thing? So if we're really talking about healthcare, it's not necessarily just about wellness or some kind of global aspect of healthcare. Can we really tailor and, and create specific kinds of interventions in creative work? Um, so you know, basically, to address these three different areas, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about research that I've been doing over the course of my PhD uh, to gain access to creative experience, assess what's going on, and then to personalize uh, uh, these therapeutic interventions. So first. Uh, um, I want to talk about work that we did rolling out uh, music composition software in a, um, in a state hospital environment. So this is video from Tewksbury Hospital. It's a little bit dark, but basically um, at Tewksbury what we did uh, was we took a program called Hyperscore, which you see down there in the, in the bottom left of, 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 the, uh, of the slide. Hyperscore wasn't developed by me. It was developed by a team in, at our lab, at the MIT Media Lab. And basically what it lets you do is paint your compositions. So you know what's happening here is that I'm going to enter in simple motivic material. So this is a short melody. Uh, here's another one. I've got five of these melodies. Each melody I'm going to give a color. And then when I paint in this score window, it's going to basically layer my melodies against one another. As long as I have a painted line, it's going to repeat that melody. Now, if I take a bunch of melodies and just line them up against each other like that, they're not going to make harmonic sense. So really, the research behind Hyperscore is to take the rules of Western harmonic tradition and to build them into the interface. So you know, for, for musicians, musicians out there, uh, it's almost like harmonic quantization. Basically, it, it takes the, the intention uh, or the, the, the contour of, of the melodic and thematic lines that I've created and uh, fits them into, into a tonal system without breaking the kind that you know really the the the, the trajectory uh, uh, um, without breaking the content of, of what it is that I was trying to create in my themes and you know this is an example of a kind of piece that people even with little to no background in music can can create in hyperscore very quickly so you know typically it was a it was a software mainly designed for children and uh, you know as part of uh, uh, um, you know large community rollouts again. And, uh, but we'd work with children in mentorship kinds of models, so intensive three, two, three week, uh, uh, five day a week kinds of sessions. And you know, at the end of, of, of that period, you know, they're making pieces like this that are very well organized, that have clearly different sections, that build to some kind of climax, that, that have a coda. And, and basically, it's just giving kids the opportunity to start structuring composition without uh, um, really having to labor over the rules of, 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 of harmonic tradition, which, which can take years to accomplish before getting access to this kind of holistic creative act. So, so that's what Hyperscore does. 
And um, when I started in, uh, it's been highly successful in these kinds of groups. And uh, when I started I, in the research lab, I started thinking about, you know, how could we apply this to clinical communities? So what would access to this kind of creative tool mean where people have severe physical and cognitive needs? So, you know, here it's being used in this hospital environment. Um, Tewksbury is a long-term chronic care environment, so patients are living there. Um, there. We worked in a lockdown psychiatric unit, which you see here, and then a physical health unit, which you see here. In the lockdown psych unit, patients had bipolar disorders, schizophrenias. Um, they had a lot of suicidal behaviors, hallucinations, so a very serious kind of uh, 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 spectrum of disease there. And then the physical health wing, I mean, it was a whole gamut again. It was, uh, yeah, that was... Turning the ALCS, yeah. Okay, so um, in the physical health wing, it was uh, stroke by um, Alzheimer's disease, cerebral palsy, so a whole range of cognitive and, and, and physical disability there. And, you know, you see a lot of mentorship going on, so we would partner up with, with the patients. Um, never really, not even really composing with them, but in a kind of reflective process, you know, what are you trying to do? You know, uh, are there different ways of doing that? Uh, being supportive. Um, sort of encouraging them to use their ears and uh, uh, um, to kind of proactively compose and, and experiment. Uh, you know, by the end of three months of an intervention here, what we saw was, you know, real, real change, both in the community and for, for individual patients. So, um, whereas when we started in the psychiatric wing, patients were completely uncommunicative with us, you know, they weren't, they just, it's part of their disease profile. They certainly weren't communicating with each other. Um, you know, by the end, they were naming pieces. They were inviting their peers off the unit to see what they had done. Um, the, the hospital as a whole opened up new programs where people from the psychiatric wing would start mentoring physically limited patients in the, um, uh, uh, in the physical health wing. Um, you know, basically, patients were moving and thinking differently as a result of gaining access to the creative opportunity. Uh, almost 100% of the patients that we worked with in the psychiatric wing moved into new phases of their treatment. This is a group of about 12 people, um, exclusively based on what they were showing in the hyperscore work, as far as ownership, feelings of self-worth, and decreased negative behavior. So patients, I mean, we had one guy who, eight months leading up to the hyperscore work, had a suicide attempt every single month. And then in the hyperscore sessions, three months of work with none of those kinds of behaviors, then in his ability to frame feelings of self-worth around the composing act um, was deemed able to move out of the hospital and into new kinds of halfway housing uh, interventions. And then in the physical side, we'd meet people like this. This is Dan Elsie. Someone will come up later on in the presentation as well. So he has palsy. It's a little bit difficult to see, but he can't. Um, he's in a wheelchair. He can't speak. He can't move below the neck. And he has this infrared pointer here that he uses to spell out sentences on this little text-to-speech device. And, and it takes him about a minute to enter in, in, in a sentence. Not the best device. There are better things. But uh, um, you know, it's just incredibly slow. And, and uh, in a normal conversation, often he'll, he'll freeze up and, and um, uh, you know, lose whatever it was that he was tracking. So he's got a lot of pathology. And, uh, but we modified that infrared pointer so that he'd be able to uh, paint a hyperscore composition again slowly, but you know more importantly in his own time. So this is him basically playing that the end of that piece for his treatment team: physical therapist, occupational therapist, uh, myself, and uh, my advisor Todd Macover. Here's the final chord. <laughs> Then we invited an orchestra in to the hospital. Again, it's really dark, but uh, uh, to play the patient composition. So this is, again, uh, the end of Dan's piece. Uh, and this is a performance for the entire hospital community, uh, the physicians, the patients, also the community at large, which, you know, you can imagine these kinds of institutional environments. There's always an awkward kind of relationship. So for them to come in and see really the, the, the creative accomplishment of, of the patients and also their ability to redefine themselves as composers completely separately from you know, the services they require basically as, as you know, uh, uh, having this kind of disease profile was, was also really meaningful. <laughs> You know, part of what was so 
impactful of this work, I think, is that uh, the patients were really able to redefine themselves in the context of creative work uh, um, while simultaneously pursuing specific health changes. So, you know, th their, their, their behavior changed, their thinking changed, their movement changed, but all that was subsumed by this kind of creative def definition. I'm a composer now, this is something that I can do, and offering that back to the hospital community uh, uh, as, as a surrogate for the kinds of accomplishments that they were making clinically uh, um, it's a particular way of non-invasively kind of addressing, addressing health care uh, issues. Um, so, um, you know, here are the different, you know, every patient composition hyperscore is different. So, you know, they're structurally different. They sound different. So there's a lot of space for individual contribution. Um, and, you know, just a sampling of the kind of outcomes that we saw. Uh, you know, moving into new phases of treatment based on behavioral changes, but also things like schizophrenic patients that were having fewer auditory and, and visual hallucinations when they were working in this kind of environment, excuse me, this kind of environment compared to other types of treatments. And, you know, they do have music at the hospital, just without technology, traditional music therapy, but uh, what was going on here is different, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, nonverbal, noncompliant patients start organizing their cognition, and, and, and that becomes a spring of new kinds of treatments. Uh, um, and also behavioral changes. Um, we talk a lot about the individual case studies coming out of this, uh, uh, how patients seem to be accessing it both uh, as an opportunity and then also how they structure it as in relation to their, uh, their symptoms. And um, I guess the two primary out the I mean, really what I'm trying to get at over the course of this presentation are what are the design principles for these kinds of creative applications that can touch on healthcare. And uh, really the two design criteria that fall out of the Tewksbury work um, is that we're kind of redefining scale. Um, that, uh, um, you know, it's not just scale in terms of a bunch of consumers that can access this kind of application. It's this kind of multidimensional scale. So it has values sort of in the hospital community as a thing that a large group of Healthcare of, of proactive, health-minded individuals then pursue, uh, uh, in addition to you know a number of separate individuals that are finding individual gains, and then also uh, you know it's a product focus, which is significantly different than a lot of the applications of music in healthcare environments. So you know, which is all about really the relationship building around music, uh, 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 you know, the process of making music in, in a clinical environment. But here we're saying that anyone can create finished compositions. And having that artifact, that complete artifact at the end of the process, is really what allows the patients to uh, um, identify themselves as composers. Uh, yeah? I'm curious, and I'm, you know, I mean, know from your work that you're mostly focused on the music side, but how, how much of this do you feel like has to do with having any creative endeavor, like maybe mm -hmm. making art pieces or you know, visual art pieces or something like that versus music. Do you think there are particular affordances of music which tie to this more than other? Yeah, well, as we get into some of the later technologies in this talk, uh, uh, um, you know, they really take advantage of the specific distribution of, of music in the brain, which, which I do think is special. But you know, what, I, what I hope coming out of this work is, and, and really where I see it going in the future, is generalizing beyond music and being something about you know, really creativity in healthcare. So you know, I want to think about you know, what's the platform where patients or, or any proactive-minded you know, uh, 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 consumer can access sort of significant health thinking as part of an application with significant secondary value. And music has a lot of that value, but so do many other things. So. Regarding hyperscore, I, I'm thinking of a lot of, one of the things that obviously brings is a low uh, barrier of entry for composition right. and recording. There are a lot of products that don't go quite that far, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, Cakewalk, uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a looping programs and stuff lock mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Were there other design criteria with hyperscore beyond lowering the barriers or something, you know, intentional about the interface that's therapeutic or engaging or was lowering the, the barrier to entry, the, the main goal focus? So, so lowering the barrier to entry is, is the starting point. But you know, it's also the starting point for a guitar hero kind of experience. So I think that the issue is really not just uh, um, creating this kind of open-ended access. It's also having the minimum of structure built in for people to, to do something real. You know, to, you know here they're, they're, they're really composing. You know, I mean, the pieces they make at the end, they're like, wow, this is, this is a killer composition. And you know, it, it's not some metaphor of composing. It's not like composing. 
And, and uh, you know, I think escaping metaphor in these kinds of accessible music and creative experiences is an important thing. You know, uh, again, in guitar, you know, just to use Guitar Hero as an example, because it's something a lot of people are familiar with, you know, you like performing. But is there anything like performing? Really, no. I mean, you know, and, and as a result, it loses so many of the essential features. You know, the, uh, the, um, you know, the collaborative thing, the way that you're with a group of performers, you know, the community aspects. And, uh, you know, the, the, there are a lot of critical things there happening uh, 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 that, that get accessed by patients, uh, uh, you know, who, who, who then, you know, attach their, their uh, therapeutic process to these kinds of events. So, you know, it's about um, providing access, but also the structure to do something significant and real. Yeah. Um, in a way, the stuff that was happening in, in Tewksbury suffers still from a lot of the issues in uh, uh, you know, traditional music therapies, uh, creative work without technology. Um, patients are highly motivated. It's a resource-intensive kind of intervention. And in the end, we ask, you know, if I want to focus in now on one patient who made some change, significant clinical change, uh, you know, what was responsible in the interface? So, you know, if I look at this patient who had schizophrenia, I mean, you know, decreases in hallucinations, you would think that this is something that's beyond the kind of motivating principle. But then, you know, someone sitting right next to him in the session work and getting the same kind of feedback for us, you know, who, who changes his behavior and, uh, uh, um, you know, is encouraged to then start communicating with people around his piece of music, that probably is more of a, a, a motivational kind of aspect. So, uh, basically, I think we need new interfaces that also have a, a significant assessment built into them so that we can start thinking about targeting uh, uh, certain types of neural or, or, or even physical change. So uh, uh, the second question has to do with assessment. And uh, we want to capture disease progression as, as, as part of creative work. So uh, to do so, we, we wrote a grant uh, that we received um, from the Alzheimer's Association and the Intel Corporation uh, to look at Alzheimer's disease and music. So one of the things that was so interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that we know so much about the biology of it. Uh, we know sort of the earliest uh, 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 site of um, the neurochemical changes that happen in, in Alzheimer's. We know the kind of cognition that's embedded in that site. So basically it gives us, uh, uh, that understanding is a, uh, uh, is a springboard to then uh, develop applications. So uh, basically the method is that uh, we looked at all the literature that, uh, that we could find about uh, Alzheimer's diagnosis and in particular what's effective at diagnosing uh, early. Um, all of those tests happen to be vision-based. And the kind of thing that we saw is um, uh, uh, like this in, on the right-hand side. Turns out that uh, the earliest site of disease in Alzheimer's is really mostly uh, about associative learning. So it's not just a short-term memory or this kind of thing. It's much more specific than that. It's about you know, the idea that this object you know, belongs here. And, and, uh, not just the memory of that as an event, but really like the, the, the multi-object relationship, the object and its context. Uh, uh, so the kinds of things that are happening in, in these tests is, uh, um, you know, I, I, I have to make object and location associations. Uh, I then get a cue. I have to remember those associations. But again, it's all vision-based. So, you know, going back to the method, what we wanted to do was to adapt existing tests uh, to work in the auditory space. And uh, we wanted to not just use sort of sine waves or laboratory-esque kind of uh, material, but we wanted to establish a normative group, meaning you know, to make sure that the general population performs similarly on the task uh, as a baseline, uh, uh, sort of how, to, how, how does a healthy group perform uh, uh, with real music. So, um, and then once you have that kind of baseline, you then test a group that you know has Alzheimer's disease against your baseline and determine, you know, is it effective at pulling out the disease? Do the groups perform differently? So to do this, we, we collaborated with Harvard Medical School, and we're just finishing up our, our, our clinical trials now. Um, uh, and we built it into a lot of different platforms, mobile platforms. And basically what happens in, in our tests, auditory tests, is that you'll flip over a location and you'll hear a little snippet of, of audio, like one and a half seconds of, of audio. And, uh, um, depending on which, which, which group you're in or which trial you're in, uh, that audio is going to be different. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about those groups in a second. But uh, you, you have to memorize which audio was at this location. Then you wait a moment, and you just hear the audio, and you click on the location where it was. Now, if you're on the third or fourth uh, 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 iteration of this test, 
you're going to hear four, three or four different uh, uh, audio and location pairs. And uh, uh, then randomly, you're going to hear the audio cues, and you have to remember the sequence. So unlike uh, uh, the game Simon, you, know, you don't build up a sequence uh, of, of uh, uh, music in order. Every time you get the test from the second to the third trial, everything, everything's totally new again. Because uh, it's not about this kind of sequential thing. It's about you know, totally new kinds of, of pairs of information. Um, to develop that normative group, and basically to make sure that musicians don't seem like they never get Alzheimer's disease, because they do, uh, we have a bunch of, we have this kind of vector of, of stimuli sets of increasing sort of musical complexity. So we start out with just single pitches. We then go to uh, 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 computerized tones and then eventually sequ short sequences of pitches. And the idea is at each step to add slightly more uh, uh, um, information that someone could use as a cue uh, uh, to remember uh, one piece of audio as an object compared to another. So, the, so if you have a three note sequence, You've got uh, uh, the contour of that sequence, you know, pitches, uh, different pitches, and then that becomes maybe, uh, uh, you know, you can think of it geometrically or you can think of it, uh, 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 you know, any number of ways, uh, and, and which is very different than just a single pitch where you have just that one feature that you're, that you're locking onto. Um, eventually, we get into harmonically related sequences of, of, of music uh, with very simple orchestration, non-harmonically related. Uh, you know, popular music, uh, uh, um, popular music that's, that's uh, stylistically distant. So, you know, we, 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 we developed this kind of vector. And, uh, you know, we don't have a formal way of, of looking at, like, the similarity of one of these groups uh, uh, of stimuli to another, although that kind of stuff does exist in, 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 the, in the music analysis space. Um, but, you know, for this piloting, we basically just, just went with uh, um, these, these groups that, that uh, uh, and then sort of semantically describe the, the evolving feature space. And then when we started, uh, uh, so this is from our normative population. Interestingly, uh, uh, one of the only areas that uh, uh, where the musicians uh, um, perform significantly better than the non-musicians, so the musicians are here uh, in, in the light gray, uh, was with single piano tones. So basically what we're finding and, and what we hypothesize, I mean, the musicians do perform better uh, in, uh, you know, across, across the board, but it's only statistically significant for, for single piano tones, and that's what you see here. Uh, um, it's incredibly frustrating for the musicians in our groups, but what our hypothesis is that, you know, these are musicians that were absolute experts, 17 years of, or, or more of music training, uh, formal music training, theory training, ear training, and in the case of single memorizing these single tones in this kind of visual spatial space, it's almost a direct analog to the types of things that they were doing in their formal music training, in their ear training. But as soon as you move into even a slightly or incrementally more sophisticated stimuli set with just sequences of notes, there is really no direct analog, and, and they, they don't find that their, their music experience provides an advantage. So even in a space like with the uh, you know, Mozart string quartets that are stylistically similar, so the entire set is like from the same string quartet, I'd have subjects that with that one and a half seconds of that stimuli would be able to say, oh yeah, that's from this you know, quartet and I played that and you know, it's one of my favorites. But you know, in this kind of grid space, this visual spatial test uh, uh, you know, didn't, didn't do any better than the general population. Um, you know, then if we look at the strategy sophistication, you know, if you look at these error bars, I mean, basically it's all over the map. We, we came up with a way of, of quantifying you know, let's see, how sophisticated the strategies were that they were using. So uh, um, you know, how many uh, um, um, how many different strategies they were using to, uh, um, to encode or, or define the auditory object? Were they, were they coming up with uh, uh, you know, semantically meaningful labels, or were they coming up with shapes to, you know, from, from basically another domain of cognition and then using that to, to help kind of organize their thinking of the audio? And uh, it was completely all over the place. Uh, you know, not only was there not one consistency from, from one musician to another and kind of honing in and finding a, a strategy that worked, uh, um, but uh, um, you know, there was also no significant difference from, from one another. Uh, and then also in, in, in the conclusion, the musicians didn't, uh, there was no confidence. No one felt that they were coming up with any strategies that, that was giving them an adva one advantage or another. Um, so this is about an hour of testing. So you know, many, many iterations across these different stimuli sets. So there's plenty of opportunity, but uh, uh, no real strategic solution, even with expertise. Um, so then we move into the diagnostic space. So these are, 
It's a small subject study. Um, these are patients with the very earliest phases of Alzheimer's disease. So here they are um, in their kind of standard uh, uh, Alzheimer's batteries. So these are two tests, the mini mental status exam and the, the MOCA, um, that are absolutely, I mean, if you're at risk of having Alzheimer's disease, you're probably going to take these, these two tests. And then that determines usually whether or not, in consultation with your doctor, whether or not you're going to then move into MRI and, and other kinds of imaging strategies. Um, and you know, with a 29 and 28, which is the kind of average performance for our control group and our, our uh, uh, diseased group, you know, they're actually, they're not getting diagnosed as Alzheimer's here. Uh, you know, with a 25, basically to get, to even be considered really for, for follow-up kind of Alzheimer's treatment, you know, you're really looking at scores in, in 24 or below. You know, to get, a, a, for, for early Alzheimer's diagnosis, mild Alzheimer's, uh, fully blown Alzheimer's, you're really thinking of like 22, 21 kind of range. So these are patients that were coming into the, our, our collaborator's office mainly because of behavioral problems. Their families were bringing them in. And then through extensive batteries of testing and, and usually neuroimaging, they would then determine that these patients were in fact uh, in the earliest phases of Alzheimer's disease. So we purposely picked a disease group that, that didn't have fully blown Alzheimer's, but is really on the fringe, this kind of uh, uh, on the verge of developing fully, fully blown Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, um, so these are patients that are still active in their lives, recognizing their family members, self-sufficient, mobile, all these kinds of things. And um, basically what we're seeing in our, our uh, um, in this auditory test, smaller number of, of trials, is that um, you know, there are conditions where they perform significantly different than the general population. Uh, you know, age-matched uh, controls in, in education and, and uh, uh, um, uh, and activities of daily life. So, you know, th th they're different in, in three-note piano excerpts. They're different in, in stylistically different uh, uh, popular music. They're different in, in our classical examples. Uh, uh, they're similar in, in uh, pop examples where, where, there's, uh, um, where it's stylistically similar. So, basically, uh, this is still, you know, we're still working and tuning and trying to find, you know, what the ideal kind of stimuli sets are you know, for really pulling out the two groups. But I think the take home message is that, you know, even in, in, a, in, in the most difficult kind of population, we could find uh, really the at risk kind of cases and, and really before significant memory impairment that, you know, that we really are able to pull out differences in this kind of auditory memory task for quite a few of our different stimuli groups. So this is really encouraging and uh, uh, thinking about, you know, working with real music and you know, having this kind of diagnostic, quantifiably diagnostic uh, in information. And um, so where we're going with all of this is that we're now thinking of you know, what's the next kind of hyperscore experience going to be like, where instead of just having this kind of window where I'm entering in a series of notes as a motive, I'm going to basically have melodic or musical creation material in a way that's going to build on the foundation of these kinds of tests. You know, this is, in a way, this is about the least creative application we could think of, but as a foundation is a way of working with auditory information and visual spatial uh, 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 cognition in a way that's diagnostic that, can, that, that we can now build applications uh, uh, that, that, that bake that into the active composition. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of a, 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 a holistic idea that we're thinking of now is, you know, whereas you look at uh, um, even state of the art in, in kind of Alzheimer's embedded healthcare technology, you know, uh, th there's this kind of vector of, of new technologies that people are talking about. On one end, you have the kind of traditional clinical uh, environment where, you know, state-of-the-art Alzheimer's diagnosis is, you know, new kinds of imaging, you know, fMRI in Alzheimer's, and, you know, are particularly effective, uh, um, you know, but they're expensive, they're invasive, and, and it's unclear, you know, how or when patients are even going to access those kinds of technologies. I mean, you know, typically in Alzheimer's, patients are not getting diagnosed. It's a, it's a stigmatized disease. Their families are bringing them in 100% of the time. Uh, they tend to get diagnosed one to two years after they actually have signs of the disease. So, you know, we also know that pharmacological interventions are right around the corner, but, you know, really the need is about diagnosing early. So, you know, we need these kinds of technologies that uh, uh, don't leverage capital equipment, but, you know, they're actually embedded in the home. Um, the kinds of areas that like this is more of an intel perspective, you know, if we look at uh, HCI research, embedding sensors that look at patterns of behavior, you know, how elders move through the home, uh, you know, and then creating applications in automation and prompting and, you know, communities of support in elder care. Uh, um, 
it's really mainly monitoring and involving patients with their data. So the question is, you know, is that enough to really sort of beat back the, the stigmatized aspect of these diseases and uh, uh, motivate patients to be proactive? And, and I actually believe that, 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 that they're not, uh, that we, we need applications that have value, uh, um, you know, secondarily to, to uh, um, the kind of data or information that you're involved with. So, you know, on the other vector, the way that people are in these environments is more of a usability kind of question. You know, how do we behave in the types of applications that we're involved in? You know, how do we interact with the tools or the experiences that we care about? You know, and that's basically uh, uh, whether in these kinds of mobile or, or distributed environments or whether it's in the, in the home, uh, um, you know, that's a display of performance and ability and, you know, can, can we basically leverage that to then create diagnostics uh, uh, as part of these kinds of applications. And I, I think we can. So assessment as part of interaction with information uh, uh, in these kinds of systems. And then lastly about personalization. So uh, um, we're talking about access and intervention uh, in a kind of much more structured, proactive, and, and long-term relationship. So you know, here we're going to talk about a collaboration with this guy, Dan Elsie. So Dan. Uh, um, we discovered him at Tewksbury. Uh, he was incredibly enthusiastic about composing and really good at it. So you know, he he basically became a, a long-term collaborator and started thinking. In addition to having access to, to to composition, what if he could perform a piece of music uh, in time, you know, with expression and nuance and and detail, um, despite these kinds of issues uh, about about timing and delivery being his really his kind of fundamental limitation. Um, so we developed this interface uh, uh, basically to empower immediate communication and expression. Um, and the technology, in a way, is in incredibly simple. I mean, it's an infrared camera, you know, another infrared pointer. At the beginning, we were thinking, you know, can we look at his position in the chair and his breath and, you know, his head movement in kind of three-dimensional space. But, uh, uh, and all those things were possible, but in the end we went with this kind of interface because it was directly analogous to what he had the most kind of experience uh, with, you know, his text-to-speech device. So that's what he's working in with his occupational physical therapist, where he has the most control. It's where he thinks about, you know, the creation of line and, and has the most experience with kind of delivering movement, uh, uh, goal-intended movement. Really, so much more, uh, so much more of his expressivity is, is um, you know, riddled with kind of aut autonomic uh, uh, issues and, and, and pathology. And uh, basically the design process was to, uh, ex first we started examining his movement in, in musical concepts. I, I mean, he doesn't have, like most people have, you know, even the simplest experiences of like what it means to, you know, press a piano key. Like that goal-directed movement and the auditory, uh, uh, immediate auditory feedback. So, you know, we started, playing lots of music ex musical examples, things where, you know, the performer would start out very quiet and then would explode over the course of like three seconds, very short. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of videotaping, looking at his, his movement, the way that, you know, we would say, let's move to get, you know, how would you think about this performer moving? And, you know, how would you move in a way to really show or express this kind of thing? So really open-ended, you know, unstructured, lots of video. It, it really works because we had a relationship with Dan. I mean, you know, we're in the hospital with him. I mean, at the end of the Tewksbury stuff, you know, we just want to do more. You know, we were friends. So, so you know, we could really have that kind of open-ended uh, uh, um, design process, and, and, and it wouldn't feel awkward. Um, so we wanted to place the sensor, the input, at the most expressive output of the subject for Dan. That, that's, you know, his head movement. Um, we need to choose a metaphor. So, you know, we're in this kind of abstraction space. I mean, Dan's not going to play the piano directly. So in the end, we, we, through working with him, we, we found something that was part like conducting and part like solo performance. So part of the interface, he's going to be cueing individual uh, instruments like a conductor will with organized movements that start and stop in time. Um, but then more holistic movements, shaping movements that he has are going to change dynamics and phrasing in time. Um, then we have to come up with the, the, the data to, uh, to describe that kind of movement, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And uh, then we have to assign those parameters to musical events. So, you know, the way that something like kinematics or statistics of his movement or, or even more sort of global shape kinds of analysis uh, uh, make specific musical changes. Um, and then kind of the most exciting part of the work here at the very end, you know, really 
half of the development time was, was building this system as a kind of engineering solution, but really half of it was working with him as we would with any performer. You know, we had the system in place, and then it was much more along the lines of a master class. You know, uh, we had, he'd composed a piece of music ahead of time. We were connecting the system to that piece of music and, you know, talking about what the system needed to do for him to be able to go bigger in this section or, or for him to have really specific control in the opening of the piece to, 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 um, you know, to, to focus on one kind of expression that was particularly meaningful to him. Uh, uh, and then, you know, lots of rehearsal and iterating and resetting those thresholds and, and the parameterization of the, of the interface for it to be able to, uh, to allow him to, to go to these places expressively, um, but also not to stifle uh, his movement. So we don't want these kinds of automatic solutions where it's like always expressive to the same, uh, uh, um, you know, always expressive to the same amount such that he doesn't have sort of individual control. Um, so uh, I guess, let's see, now would be a good time to, uh, I'm going to actually play the, the play, I'm going to play his performance and uh, it's about three minutes long. Yeah, let's see. Second, I'll get back to the presentation here. Yep. So that's that's Dan's performance, and that um, the piece it took him about a year to compose, and about six months for us to do the complete collaboration. Uh, you know, a lot of programming at the hospital, kind of over Dan's shoulder to get the thing to wrap to just his movement. So, you know, it's 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 pathological. That it's different in one hemisphere than another. Um, you know, it's it's often spastic. Um, and then also to make the meaningful connection so that, uh, um, so that the thing would reparameterize based on where he is in the piece of music. So, you know, here's a quick overview of the system. He composes in hyperscore where he creates, you know, lines that correspond to different parts. Um, in hyperscore, he can orchestrate. So, you know, he has some lines that are cellos and violins and these kinds of things. So here he has a complete score. Um, 
Then uh, Hyperscore spits out a, the MIDI tracks of every one of the uh, lines, basically, that he's used to compose. And uh, that gets orchestrated in a sequencer. So, you know, where a, we had a single cello line, that becomes maybe 15 different kinds of cellos with different timbre, qualities of cello, qualities of sound. Uh, um, and uh, those different tracks will play, you know, will have for the entire composition. So, you know, 15 different cello versions of, of, of that line for Dan's piece. And um, we do that for all of his different instruments. So it, it, it gets orchestrated and uh, uh, so that he can access and make choices between different kinds of, of, of timbre and qualities of sound, uh, uh, like a conductor would. Uh, um, and then that's all in MP3 files, and uh, in performance, he's kind of jumping between those different tracks. Uh, the kinds of data that we're looking at, so we're doing a minimal amount of filtering, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving average filtering in two different sized windows to do a, you know, some kind of smoothing of his, of his uh, uh, movement. Uh, but we really, I mean, moving average filtering is not very significant. We really kept uh, the filtering to a minimum. Uh, um, you know, we worked, we worked with the noise, uh, you know, that he had uh, within the kind of system. Um, you know, we looked at all the basic kinematics, position, velocity, acceleration. Uh, you know, we had simple statistics, you know, what's his minimum and maximum position within, uh, you know, the, a long-term window and, and a short window of time in the piece. Um, and then, you know, looking at shape, we, we had a, a representation of how curved versus how linear his movement is in time. Uh, um, and while all that different data is creating these kinds of uh, 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 con sensor contours, um, we then uh, have scalars to, to amplify that, uh, uh, that data. And then if this is the piece of music here, um, we have these time points in the piece where there are significant sort of structural or thematic changes. So, and then all of the uh, sensor data gets differentially scaled, uh, so it's weighted as far as how meaningful it is uh, for expressive control based on where he's in the piece. Yeah? How much of this did you explain to him? Or for, for example, did he understand that there was an explicit control between linear and high curvature movements, or is that you sort of acting as a black box from his perspective on purpose? Yeah, we were definitely a black box, and, and uh, really between his movement and the metaphor. And then really how we looked at, you know, the mapping part was, you know, contributing to these metaphors that he, you know, that we could have discussion around. So, you know, in the, in, in the way that he would think of it as, as the conducting part, you know, he would say something like, you know, we were swapping back and forth between the, the interface and his text-to-speech device, he would say, you know, I need tighter control over instrument selection, you know, and, and we knew that we had some bag, you know, some short list of these uh, variables that were contributing to, to, you know, make orchestration changes, and we would tighten it up based on where he is in that, in that section. And then we'd go through a performance and we'd say, you know, so how did that work? And, you know, it, at the climax, I need to be able to make it bigger. I need to be able to pull everything back. And uh, so, and we did a lot of that by hand. Um, you know, although, so, for instance, at the very beginning of the piece, there is no ex dynamics control. I mean, it's flat, and all he's doing is making movements that start and stop to control the, the, the timbre of the instruments. Much later, he continues to do that to a lesser degree later on in the piece, where he has more dynamic control over things like the supporting harmonies. Then he'd tell us, well, I don't care about the harmonies now. I want to control the uh, dynamics of the, of the main line. What was, we were sort of blown away by was his ability to interact with us in, the, uh, us in those musical terms, uh, despite being really a naive kind of performer. I mean, he hasn't had that experience before, but he, know, he knew like, what needed to grow and, and, and be in a way to, to, to create a convincing uh, performance. So that, that was really encouraging. So we're starting to think that in the same way that Hyperscore, you know, people kind of have this innate knowledge of you know, how to structure something with a beginning and a middle and an end, and you, know, you, you can work with them to that extent. Uh, uh, in this kind of per expressive performance controller, you know, he knew how he wanted this thing to, to map to his piece. So I think that's an active area where we can you know, develop new kinds of technologies. You know, imagine if he had his own markup language where he could you know, index into this kind of piece and then you know, parameterize this kind of thing. I think that's realistic. So you know, the challenges are trying not to choke the description of his movement with too much filtering, uh, you know, scaling data and setting thresholds, and you know, choosing the point in the performance timeline. Each of these areas now, I think, um, in the research, we're, we're working on you know, making more adaptive and automatic. You know? So how can I give Dan, you know, if I give anybody Dan's interface and they're using it with their hands and you know, trying to create an expressive performance, it's just not going to work. I mean, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't, wouldn't work for anybody because it's wrapped to Dan. You know, but could I, give, could I place the sensor on you know, somebody you know, in, in, in an expressive environment and then you know, give them the tools to be able to you know, map to some kind of performance? I think that would be interesting. So, 
anyway, the, the, the perspective here for this work is that really there is no physical disorder or, or, or disability in terms of these applications, that there's just a particular definition of expression. What we're trying to do is to amplify that, that expression with the interface and connect Dan to the creative experience. Now, when he's in this environment, his physical therapist observes that he moves with more control and accuracy than in any other thing. And she's been working with him for 20 years in you know, head pointing tasks. Granted, they're, they're, they're not necessarily continuous like we're doing in, in this environment, but, uh, uh, but that's significant. So you know, basically, we're, we're really thinking that uh, um, you know, there's something different about the way that the auditory environment can support this kind of, uh, uh, of movement uh, really as a rehabilitation. So what does it mean for Dan to use this kind of thing on, on a regular basis? Since doing this work, uh, he's given performances for thousands. You know, we, we did a TED talk. He, he gave a TED performance. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he's a composer and a performer. Uh, he has a job in the community. He's moved outside. Uh, he's still at the hospital, but, you know, they had to reconvene to think about the way that they were giving him access to a community at large because, you know, he showed that he could have this kind of communicative you know, p potential, and uh, um, that that wasn't being seen in, in traditional kinds of therapies. Um, so the design principles coming out of all of these things now, just to wrap up, are, are that we're, um, you know, we, from the Tewksbury and community kind of scale of these tools, you know, we've got multiple dimensions of value in the community and for individuals. They're producing finished work. You know, in the Alzheimer's work, we're thinking of assessment as part of the intervention. Uh, um, and really where we're going now is we're thinking of, uh, um, you know, these kinds of things is a proactive kind of intervention uh, in, in long term. And whereas before, a lot of times expressive technologies and accessible technologies, you know, you kind of have new interfaces and they're personalized and maybe they're connecting to an application with significant value. The next steps of this research and really where I'm at now uh, uh, is trying to connect directly with underlying biology and structure neural change outside of motivation. So the issue is you know, Dan's got camera systems. We're looking at a symptomatic movement. You know, what would it mean to connect to his intention to move uh, and to look directly at the neural signal in a kind of brain instrument interface? And then, you know, can we distill what part of any kind of change in the end is part of, you know, a kind of multisensory uh, 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 thing where auditory or, or uh, visual information is either compensating or help boots, help, uh, 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 helping to bootstrap um, uh, you know, rehabilitation of disordered motor pathology. Um, so, you know, just very quickly, um, we're trying to do this with electromyographic interfaces. We're personalizing with machine learning uh, uh, classification. Um, you know, we're wrapping to these performance environments and, uh, you know, trying to modify the, the, the auditory and visual feedback in a way that maximally uh, um, uh, creates uh, uh, physical physical results and um, just very quickly you know we're doing that to, we're connecting EMG what that kind of system looks like through audio interfaces you know this is very similar to a lot of the kinds of things happening here in, in Desney Tan's group and things that you know Dan and Scott Sponis are doing You're using SV, uh, M classifiers not S SVW pulling out uh, uh, finger presses um, more like attempted finger presses in, in individuals that actually uh, uh, have disorders of, of upper extremity movement. And then, you know, looking at those finger presses in the context of a music environment where the rehabilitation is actually, uh, uh, you know, reading from, reading from scores. And uh, I'm not going to go into the algorithm for, for, for lack of time, but uh, basically what the intervention is like is, you know, an individual has probably got some gross motor movement, really lacks most fine motor control. You know, sitting at a piano, sitting in this kind of traditional instrumented environment, reading a score, We've got the model of the consistency of that person's neurological signal when they try and make finger presses. And then as they're trying to make presses in that score, when they successfully do so, they're kind of ratcheting up the sophistication of the score they have. So you know, as I successfully am making my sequences, you know, I'm actually moving kind of up a hierarchy in where and, you know, the, the, the challenge is to as quickly get to playing that Chopin ballad as possible. Uh, um, so, you know, um, we construct these scores where you know you have the same harmonic progression, and that if I successfully can enter in you know this particular finger, then I won't get this uh, uh, version of the score for my next uh, uh, for my next attempt. I'll get this version, and I'll be trying to enter in uh, these four notes at the top instead of these three notes. And so ratcheting up the performance that way. Um, uh, EMG interfaces, uh, you know, really the. 
uh, now being used in HCI, namely because of the work happening here, but also the poster child for, for uh, a robotic and prosthetic control, um, also now being used in these kinds of pathological environments. That's the kind of the research that we're using to imply some of these interfaces. And um, basically, the design challenge now sort of collapsing across the different research that we've been doing in diagnosis and, and uh, you know, performance is you know, we're trying to create biological interfaces for music learning and performance that are wrapping to an individual, so you know, they're personalized across my, my uh, movement, you know, that are adapting with them. So you know, as, I'm, as I'm improving in these kinds of uh, uh, tasks, uh, um, that, that uh, the, the, the interface is, is, is readapting to stay wrapped to the individual and basically amplifying the intention to perform by you know, creating the connection to real music learning. And uh, yeah, so basically at the end, uh, um, this is a very thesis kind of slide, but, but where we are now is that uh, um, we've got creative applications that we're using in, in communities. Uh, we're creating, you know, in many cases, the first kinds of uh, uh, auditory tests to do diagnosis that then are informing new kinds of applications. And we're starting to create a genre of personalized instruments uh, um, that can connect directly to uh, underlying biology. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And uh, um, uh, yeah, just basically thanks, thanks for attending the talk. That, that's, that's the end of the talk and our current thinking about uh, music, mind, and health. Find out more about this, is there a website or? Yeah, so, so uh, I just graduated with my thesis, so um, that's available online, and um, uh, that's probably the best, where to, the best place to see, um, you know, not only the, this work, but also some of the more kind of scientific foundations of, of uh, where we're developing these technologies. If yeah, you well, email yeah, me, yeah. I'm Dan at Microsoft.com. If you email me, I'll make sure that that'd be awesome. That'd be easy to remember. Yeah. There's a little curious about you mentioned your dad at the beginning of the talk. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, he was doing a lot of this electronic music mm -hmm. stuff. Um, mm -hmm. There was some movement in the area called minimalist music mm -hmm. and harmonic music, mm -hmm. which people were trying to break down some of the barriers of using Western music to mm -hmm. approach music from a very collaborative Sense. I'm just wondering if that has any tie-ins to your thinking directions. Yeah, definitely. Um, one, one, one thing, I, I mean, I, I love minimalist music, and, and I listen to it all the time, and uh, especially when I'm working. But, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, um, one of the things I want to do with Alzheimer's work is, is uh, in addition to thinking of these kinds of composing tools, is um, you know, directly taking the audio in the environment uh, uh, in a constructive task where people are making kind of a mixes of found sounds and things, uh, but in doing so, you know, acknowledging the, the, the origins of those sounds in a location, in a, in a distributed uh, 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 space, and, uh, and looking at that act as, as being diagnostic. So, uh, um, you know, imagine the sounds of, of my, you know, my home, and then being able to construct audio kind of messages or keys or cues or things from that. Um, you know, maybe not for full composition, but uh, uh, definitely in terms of, of uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the minimalist environmental sound kind, kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the first part of your talk focused on the therapeutic value of composition and creative experiences, particularly in that case for psychiatric patients. Mm -hmm. it's sort of a, it's part of kind of a growing swell of data to support that kind of therapeutic value. Mm -hmm. But I think it's safe to say it's still not mainstream psychiatric therapy. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the major barriers to that becoming a mainstream part of particularly psychiatric therapy? Yeah, well, I, I'm thinking a lot about where these kinds of techno applications should live, you know, and so I think part of the issue and, and really the main barrier is the fact that, you know, you have these intensive resources to deliver, you know, a, a very, you know, different and, and difficult to, to make consistent uh, uh, uses of mu music in, in clinical work. So, you know, if I'm going to tell a patient to, you know, go and be involved with a music therapist, you know, th it's really difficult to have a good understanding of what that experience is, is, is going to be like and, and how, to, how to describe it in a way that, that I, it will even create information that I can use as a physician. So, you know, 
to me, this is a platform issue, actually. I wonder, like, where can these applications live, you know, online, where that consumers and physicians can come together, you know, to either interact with the tools that, you know, are creative or empowering, to, you know, build communities around, around creative work, uh, 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 and then also capture the data that, that makes, you know, progress clinically in those environments uh, uh, visible and, and, and manageable by, by, by physicians. Um, you know, so, so there are a lot of things happening like this already, uh, you know, online with electronic medical records. And, you know, it's, it's in the vision of um, how technologists are thinking about more healthcare and embedded healthcare information becoming available. But this is a particular kind of, kind of application focus. So, you know, I think the barrier is having, you know, one place where there's some kind of concerted access and community building that I, that I can, you know, have the kind of uh, 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 involvement with as a clinician that, that it all gets collapsed and, and makes sense and digestible to me. And in a way, that's the same problem with, you know, heart monitors or, or whatever kind of technology you're giving someone, you know, in the everyday environment. The question is, where does that data get uh, uh, um, uh, taken, uh, you know, and then collapsed in a way that's digestible by a practitioner? It's the same problem for, for creative work. Questions here? Uh, have you, the, the studies that you've done have been with people that have different challenges. Um, have you considered using these interfaces for, you know, quote, unquote, normal people? And then uh, a follow-up follow to that would be um, there's a lot of, you go out on different musicians' forums, there's a lot of pushback on modern tools, you know, auto, uh, uh, auto tune or quantization of, uh, uh, of pitch and rhythm and things like that. Um, a lot of the musician community thinks it cheapens uh, the art mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Have you had any sort of pushback like that around the tools and processes that you're developing? Yeah, well, I, I know that hi like HyperScore in particular, probably the truth is any of these applications are going to levy that kind of criticism. And, and HyperScore certainly has. I mean, you know, um, the question is always, you know, how do you transition from an assistive kind of creative tool into, you know, the real thing, like, you know, real instant, you know, uh, um, you know, using the language of the detract of detractors. You know that 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 uh, you know. Then you're going to transition to real composition or, or real kinds of instrument learning. And you know, the truth is, we do see that with 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 the hyperscore kind of thing. And and uh, you know, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, you know, with the right kind of tool. But you know, these are these are again, they're part. You know, they're part research questions, but they're also just part application design questions. So part of the issue is that you know, are are the researchers that are tackling these kinds of things in terms of you know creating Western music, you know, harmonic uh, uh, quantization, you know, going to be best able to design just that killer application that people are going to love and, and, and dive into and then have, you know, real music experiences. And, and, and in Hyperscore, it's pretty close. Uh, but, but, but so I, I think there's a real design issue to, to creating these kinds of things that, that will transition someone into, into an education experience that, that uh, um, you know, is kind of more, more traditional. But, you know, the truth is when, when you've got huge groups of people using these tools, having these experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have creatively, you know, I, I honestly feel that the, the you know, the, the criticism is kind of moot. Um, with, the, with, the perform, with the performance stuff, um, I think we are getting into a place where, you know, I mean, one perspective is that you certainly, I mean, it's a little bit gauche, but certainly, uh, you know, Dan is expressively limited in his daily life because of his disease, but, you know, to what extent are we all kind of? expressively limited? Do we lead, you know, our lives to our maximum expressive potential? And to that extent, uh, you know, creatively, and to that extent, do we have the right tools to do so? You know, and um, one of the things that we, we start talking about adaptive systems to do the kind of stuff that Dan's expressive controller does, you know, to, to, to connect him to, you know, the shaping and the sculpting of, a, of an expressive performance in time, you know, I, I, could, I could see very similar technologies being used for the general population. And, um, you know, so even if we're talking about neural interfaces of these kinds of things, you know, it, in a way, with the right kind of uh, modeling design, you know, that it doesn't matter if the person has disordered signals or normal signals, as long as it's consistent, you know, then you can build that into, into this kind of application. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Adam, one more time.